Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, both by physical presence, walk road, and uh, and also online. I mean, a little bit more people online. I see 16 people online, so not that bad. Um, my name is Michel Erke. I will be one of the speakers today together with my colleagues, uh, Mihelo and, uh, and Caroline from B12 Consulting. Uh, we are an IT service firm specializing in uh, in AI for, for several years now. Um, and today we wanted to uh, to introduce you with a topic which we believe are of really uh, big interest for not only for uh, I would say the the large companies who are used to 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 develop and to deploy uh, AI systems, but also potentially for SMBs. Uh, and this topic is really the topic of transfer learning. And and before starting, really introducing you and and giving the floor for Miego to introduce you what uh, transfer learning is about. I wanted to make a, a, a I wanted to make a small poll, a small survey, uh, to see a little bit, you know, what uh, is your current knowledge uh, about uh, transfer learning, to better understand uh, who is listening to this call, to this uh, uh, talk, and uh, and to possibly adapt uh, the speech uh, to your current knowledge. So I'm going to um, to close the presentation for a minute and to open uh, another browser where you can see uh, a WooClap session. So if you don't know about WooClap, uh, it's very easy to vote. You just go to wooclap.com and you use the code which is displayed on the screen right now. So it's R-P-J-K-E-C. Uh, so I will give you just a, a few seconds to connect. You don't need to download any application or whatever. You just need to go to the website. And uh, once you're on the website, you can actually vote uh, for the question. Uh, there will be two questions. I mean, there, I see there are three people joining. One person has voted. OK. So we we'll wait a little bit. Two persons have voted. OK, more people joining. Fantastic. So we we'll wait until we have a, a few more votes. So the first question is really about how familiar are you with transfer learning, either completely unfamiliar up to very familiar, anything in between. So feel free to choose whatever options best fit your current situation. And we adapt a little bit uh, the talk according to the result of that survey. OK, I see six people who have voted. Don't forget to vote also online. You can do it just by connecting to the wooklab.com website. Oh, I see more and more people joining, 12, 13. Okay, we already display the results. Okay, so most of you are actually unfamiliar with the notion of transfer learning or vaguely familiar. And some of you have actually already used it at least in one AI project. So that's good. I mean, you at least have some notion, but definitely there is room for improvement. So the talk will be, I think, useful for most people listening to it. So that was the first question. And I'm going to move to the second one. And the second one is actually related to the first one, but a little bit more indirectly. I'm going to ask you, from your perspective, what are the main causes that are slowing down adoption of AI technologies in Belgian SMBs? And you can vote. You can actually vote many different options at the same time. So don't hesitate to put more than one choice if you want. Lack of data, lack of technical knowledge, lack of computing resources, or lack of trust or ethical concerns about AI. I see a lot of people voting also. Fantastic. I'm going to display the results. OK. Lack of data is ranking high, but also lack of technical knowledge, lack of trust, ethical concerns. Lack of computing resources is definitely less of an issue from your perspective for the adoption of AI by Belgian SMBs. So that's good. But if we look at you know the first option which is selected, lack of data, is precisely one of the things we would like to address today by this introduction of uh, transfer learning. And I give the floor to uh, Mielo to guide you to uh, a historical perspective uh, about transfer learning, but also trying to better understand how it can actually help addressing the lack of data. So Miego, the floor is yours. Let me 
exit here and let me switch back to the presentation here we go okay thank you um so thank you everybody for being with us uh today um i'm very happy with the results of the book lab because i think the talk will be interesting for uh most of the people well at least the three quarters that answered um, that they are not very familiar with transfer learning. Apologies to the one person who is an expert on the topic. Uh, this may not be as interesting, but maybe maybe uh, it will as well. So I wanna give you a bit of a historical perspective of how we got to transfer learning in the form that we, we use it today and where we started off and uh, everything basically that happened in between. Um, so what is, what is really transfer learning? Uh, by transfer learning, we consider the concept of using knowledge that we know about one domain and applying it to another. So I uh, I asked the Stable Diffusion to um, generate a picture of what I think is a great example of transfer learning, and that's using a cannon to kill a fly. So it's uh, clearly using a, a skill and a tool from a word domain to perform a different uh, task. In this case, a very uh, a very useless task, but nonetheless. Uh, transfer learning is uh, very deeply connected to the concept of, of general intelligence and general AI, and this has to do with things of understanding how to do uh, verbal, spatial, numerical, and other, other skills. And it's essentially at the core of what we've been always trying to do with artificial intelligence from the early days. Uh, we started with algorithms that can do simple things, but we've we've always wanted to strive towards a more general um, AI and more generic problem solving skills with uh, with machines and computers. And transfer learning is essentially something that, that is at the core of this concept. Now, transfer learning begins really with us. We are excellent at transfer learning. Uh, we apply knowledge from uh, one domain to others extremely well. And actually, as kids, um, we learn, among other ways, through uh, transfer learning. So I'll give you an example of, of what this kind of means. Uh, so here's a, a cartoon that I asked AI to generate of uh, people standing in front of a picture of a lion, but it also generated this artifact of a kind of a poorly defined whitish cloud structure. So you can imagine asking, what is this thing, right? And the answer could be that, well, it looks like a flying horse that's made out of clouds. And what we've done here is we've used concepts that we're familiar with, which is flight, horses, and clouds to define a new concept, which is what we see here on the image. And if you think about it, we do this all the time. Language is full of this kind of stuff. Uh, if you learn uh, English or German, especially uh, things like composite words and so on, these are all examples of how we use transfer learning in, in uh, everyday life. Okay, so that's sort of in a nutshell uh, what transfer learning is and, and kind of uh, from a human perspective, but how does this play out with the machines? So I wanna start the story with the, with the 1950s and the perceptron. So this was the, you would arguably the beginning of the field of AI. It was the, the kind of the early attempt to develop an algorithm that could actually do something useful. In this case, classify uh, uh, items into two groups. Interestingly enough, it worked on images, which I think is why people got very excited about it but it did not really generalize well. Nonetheless, it sparked a period of time where people were very, very excited about AI, especially the military. So they started pouring a lot of money into, into AI research. But from the point of view of computational power, hardware and so on, we simply were not there yet. So it lasted for about uh, 20 years and uh, no real breakthroughs happened, which caused the funding agencies and the governments to say, okay, we're gonna stop investing in AI research. And this uh, basically led to the period that we call the first AI winter, which lasted for most of the, of the 70s. 
very uh, low amount of activity. But one, one interesting thing happened during this period, and that's the, the establishment of the transfer learning theory. So, so perhaps because people were forced to do more with less, they started thinking about how we could use algorithms in, in more clever ways with less data and so on to do other tasks. And they established the kind of uh, mathematical framework and the approach to define uh, transfer learning in the way that we know it today. Now, the next exciting development came in, came in 1986 with the, with the first application of what is called the backpropagation algorithm. And what this was, uh, was an algorithm which allowed us to train or to teach neural networks to, to learn correlations in the data very efficiently. It was really the missing piece to start doing useful things with the neural networks. The same year, people proposed the multi-layer perceptron, which was the extension of the original idea. And here the breakthrough was that they managed to prove essentially that this new algorithm can approximate any mathematical function effectively. And this was a very big deal because it, it demonstrated that neural networks can be applied on different kinds of tasks, okay? And from then on, it kind of uh, started going quickly. So in 1988, people figured out how to do image recognition uh, efficiently with, uh, with uh, uh, convolutional networks. But then the problem occurred that, yes, we could start doing very complex problems. But in order to do these complex problems, we had two, two major blocking points. One was that we needed a lot of computational power, which in the 1980s was sparse. And we needed large amounts of labeled data, which at the time nobody really had, okay? And this is basically where transfer learning came in. So to explain to you how it works in this context, this is uh, nowadays one of the common kind of uh, setups that you use if you wanna do transfer learning with image recognition. So what you would do is let's say uh, you wanted to solve a use case where you want to detect defects on metal tubes. So you would collect large numbers of, uh, of uh, images of tubes with defects. You would label everything. You would feed everything to this, uh, that, uh, to this algorithm that would then be able to classify this into uh, several categories, be normal, small scratch, large scratch, whole, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now, the problem with this is that, that you need a lot of computational power. Okay, and uh, and you need uh, large quantities of training data, but you only have to do this once. Okay, now once you've done this job and you you've invested in this algorithm, you can ask yourself, okay, now I want to detect damage on car chassis. Okay, so what you can do is you can use a part of the algorithm that you develop to detect defects on metal surfaces. And you can keep that uh, part intact or largely intact. And you can only focus on modifying the part which actually does the classification so that it can actually take into account the new information. And experience has shown that by doing this, you actually need significantly less data. And because you're not training the entire algorithm, but only a part of it, it's also a lot less computationally uh, intensive. Okay. Now, this was kind of the story from you know 1980s, 1990s. Uh, and even though we could use transfer learning, it was still largely inaccessible to, uh, to most of the small companies. And the reason was that the base models were, were not really available and they were still very expensive to, to develop and train. And in addition, in order to actually successfully use uh, transfer learning, you needed technical expertise. So you still needed to modify the algorithm in a certain way. You needed people who knew uh, how to do this. And so the first part got uh, improved significantly when people started introducing the graphical processing units into, uh, into AI. And this kind of brought a mini revolution in, in uh, uh, the ability of smaller players to develop and train these kinds of algorithms. 
So GPUs or graphical uh, cards were originally developed for video games and graphics. And uh, people noticed that basically the same kind of math operations that these processors were optimized to do, which is mainly linear algebra and matrix multiplication, stuff like this, that these are the same kind of mathematical operations that uh, we need to do a lot when we train neural networks and when we develop these models. So then they ask, okay, can we use the same technology to speed up the, the development of, uh, of AI? And they started developing software to run neural networks on these things. Uh, libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch started appearing and so on. And uh, what we observed is that basically you, you, we were starting to train these models you know, a thousand times or more faster than we could before. And so this meant that, you know, what took years before could take days now. And so finally, with a small investment in graphics cards and things like that, training deep learning models and image recognition models finally became um, um, available to, to smaller companies and not just something that's that was available to, uh, you know, large research groups, large companies, uh, governments, and so on. In fact, uh, if you look at the trends in the GPU industry, uh, what we observe today is that demand is actually driven by developments in AI and not by graphics and video games anymore. So the entire field has actually shifted towards, uh, towards AI. Okay, so that, that brings us to the 2020s. And now we're finally in what I call the age of transformers. Uh, I should probably call it the third industrial revolution, maybe. Uh, but we are in the stage now where we can actually use AI and modern technologies, not only to do image recognition, but, but finally do uh, processing of language. And this is something that for a very, very long time was quite elusive. And to give you an idea why, um, let's say the past kind of 15, 20 years or so were kind of the age where we were focusing on developing ways to analyze images, videos, and things like that. And the, inform the visual information that we're interested in is usually localized in space. And I have an example here of this dog, and you can see that, you know, he has two eyes, he has a nose, he has two ears, and an ear is an ear, no matter where it appears in an, in an image. It's lar largely actually context-free, not completely, but uh, largely. And the information about what an ear is, is really localized in a particular place in the image. Language is different, okay? Language is a lot more context dependent. And the information about relevant features in a sentence or a paragraph are usually spread out. So they're, they're completely delocalized. So you can uh, see an example of this here. If you take a sentence, that, that says she saw the man with a telescope, how we interpret that sentence depends on the context. And that's not present here, but it would probably be somewhere else in the paragraph. So I can interpret this that, that she was sawing a man through the telescope, or I can also interpret it that she saw a man who was carrying a telescope. And for an AI model to actually capture this information is a lot more challenging. But the, the transformer-based models uh, that are the core of uh, all the, the new exciting developments in AI are finally able to very efficiently capture, among other things, uh, the context of uh, textual information. Now, we live in a, in a very exciting time for, for AI. Uh, we have uh, incredible tools at our disposal, and it appears that new ones are coming up uh, every week, almost. But this is coming uh, at actually a great uh, computational costs. So at the moment, the size and the complexity of these models appears to be growing almost exponentially. And this is uh, from the point of view of small companies and SMEs using AI can be a little bit problematic because we are we are uh, limited with the, the kind of hardware resources the companies can afford. And we are at the stage where, for instance, very few companies can afford the infrastructure to even load GPT-3 or GPT-4, even less, uh, and, and run it, let alone to, to, to train it. So it may seem like we have hit the same kind of wall as we did with the computer vision a long time ago, 
uh, where, where we needed more computational power. But we are in a bit different situation right now. It turns out that what we needed to overcome with computer vision 10 years ago by introducing basically better hardware into the problem, we may not need to do now. And this is thanks to things like uh, few shot learning, which is one form of, uh, of transfer learning, which actually makes large language models, I will argue, actually usable. So how does this work? What people have observed recently is that as the complexity of the, of the large language model grows, when we try to apply them to tasks that they're not trained to do, they tend to perform very poorly, actually consistent with, uh, with a random guess, until some critical complexity. And then after this complexity, they start actually to do better and better quite, uh, quite uh, quickly. And so I call this the emergent transfer learning. So this is a wonderful thing because it's telling us that we can start using these models almost out of the box to do things that they're not originally designed to do. But we don't actually understand why this is. And that's a bit messed up. Now, how does this work? So we are at a time where we have shifted transfer learning from having to modify the algorithm itself to actually having to modify only the inputs to the algorithm. So now by taking the data that I want to analyze and modifying the, the what I call the prompt, the, the question that I want to ask to the algorithm, I can get a language model, not only to do auto-completion, but I can get it to do any number of tasks from text classification to sentiment analysis to text labeling and, and, and so on and so on. And the key point here is that for the first time, we can really do transfer learning by modifying the inputs only. That's very important. So we don't need to touch the algorithm, at least not that much, okay? Now, here's an example uh, of this zero shot learning. So I, I took my biography from the B12 uh, website. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask ChatGPT to categorize my the, the text that I gave it. And I gave it six, uh, categories, uh, which are more or less distinct, but would be a bit overlapping. And when I asked ChatGPT, which of these categories does the text I gave you fit the best, ChatGPT gave me the answer that it fits the best, the category of, of biography. So what I did here is I took ChatGPT, which is a essentially a text completion algorithm, and by carefully uh, tuning the question that I wanted to ask him, I got it to perform the task of text labeling or text classification, okay? So this sometimes wor works, but sometimes it's actually not enough. And uh, the example of when this doesn't work is when, when we don't have enough context for the algorithm to do its job properly. So I asked ChatGPT to give me the sentiment of the tweet, the weather today is purple. And actually, uh, a bit surprisingly, what it said was, well, the, the sentiment is neutral because essentially I don't know what purple means in this context. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's, uh, it's neutral and that's fine. So instead, I told it, okay, I'm gonna guide you and I'm gonna give you a few examples of, of what I mean by sentiment. So I told it, the weather today is red, that's positive. The weather today is blue, that's also positive. But green, yellow, and pink, uh, sorry, green, yellow is negative, and pink is also positive. And I asked, can you tell me now what sentiment is the tweet, uh, the weather today is purple? And what it said was actually quite nice. It said it can be considered positive. And what was very nice is that it inferred this information from the fact that red and blue are positive and red and blue combined form purple. So in this way, 
I use basically uh, a prompting to tell the algorithm what I, what I wanted to do, but I also used few examples to guide it towards the, the functionality that I wanted to, to perform. So this is called the uh, few shot learning. Okay. Now, uh, we have a few examples of uh, sort of use cases that, that um, use uh, small data and, and uh, few shot learning to show you. So I want to begin with a small video. For many of us in Brussels, trams are an important way to get around the city. This is why at Stib MIBB, we want to make sure that they run on time. Sometimes a tram breaks down in the middle of the street. This causes delays, traffic congestion, and many unhappy Brusselaires. Not to mention that it is very expensive to fix. This is why at Stib MIBB, we wanted to prevent trams from breaking down. How did we do it? Together with B12 Consulting and Bagar, we developed an innovative system which allows us to detect problems with electrical lines before they can lead to tram breakdowns. An AI-powered camera system monitors electrical lines in near real-time and transfers the observations to the cloud. Data collected by the system is accessible to our tram maintenance staff where they can review it, monitor alerts, and schedule repairs before a problem occurs. The overhead line monitoring system helps us prevent tram breakdowns, leading to a better and happier Brussels. Okay, so a lot, a lot going on in the video. So where does uh, transfer learning uh, come in this case? And uh, it comes at the image recognition stage, of course. And for this project, what we did was we developed a custom solution, okay, which was based on uh, on a ResNet architecture. So it was a pre-trained model that we we took. We had to modify certain certain parts to, you know, make use of things like uh, the fact the video is continuous and so on and so on to improve the accuracy. But then, with as little as twelve, uh, about uh, two hundred labeled images. We were actually able to to uh, develop an image recognition algorithm to tag these green points on the pentograph and the electrical line with accuracy that was enough to actually satisfy the the use case at hand. So it's an example where, with very limited resources and very limited uh, investment into data, you can actually achieve something that's uh, very very valuable. Now I believe Caro has. Uh, a few words. So this is another use case, uh, which we did before uh, ChatGPT. So what we wanted to do, I guess you don't see the top, but it's uh, an auto automatically uh, label uh, some documents for a large company who deals with a lot of documents and now they're doing it manually. Uh, no, they're not doing it manually anymore. So what we did is use um, a large language model, which is, was not at the time quite large as the, they've now become. And we um, use a large language model to produce tokens, vectors of tokens will kind of give a mathematical representation of the document. So tokens are a mathematical rep representation of each word, but we also give some information about the context in which it's used. Uh, and then what, the only step we needed to do and for which we needed data was the classification or the labeling uh, steps for which we needed a smaller uh, set of data. I, I pulled small data in between uh, quotes because um, there was a lot of labels to, to cover it. And so we needed a small amount of data per, um, per labels. I think we had 50, 50 documents labeled uh, per, per, class, per class, classification label. Okay, and the third and uh, last example is a project which actually just finished, which is going uh, for the first time in production this week. Uh, it's a project uh, we, we were working for um, some uh, uh, legal uh, professionals, so people uh, uh, who are actually uh, checking legal documents. And the project was about 
uh, trying to check some self-consistency rules between the documents. So checking that some informations were consistent across all the documents in a given set of documents. Okay, so those professionals have to deal with relatively large number of documents for a specific case, and they have to check that across all the documents, the information is uh, correct and it's self-consistent between uh, one and the other. Uh, so the problem there is not really to define the rules. I mean, the professionals can define the rules of, uh, of self-consistency, but the problem is to extract the right information from the document. And it might look simple, but it's actually a, a specifically difficult problem. For example, if you say, what is the, uh, uh, the, the address of the person selling the good for a contract, for example? Well, maybe the address of the person is defined at the beginning of the document, but the fact that this person is actually the person selling the good is only defined on page three of the document, okay? And you have to make connection between those different notions. And that can be, uh, I mean, that's a relatively simple example, but that can be much more complex than that, uh, depending on which type of data you really want to extract. So it's not just about, you know, finding some address somewhere and finding some proximity with the name of a person. It can be much more complex than that. And you have actually to take into account the entire context of the document. And for that, we used um, large language models. We actually used a kind of cascade of large language models because obviously we could just, you know, throw the data at GPT-4 and let it uh, find the answer. But there are several problems with that. There is the cost of using GPT-4. There is also uh, some confidentiality issues because those documents are legal documents with a lot of confidentiality concerns. Uh, there are also uh, issues about, you know, the maximum number of tokens you can provide to a, a, a complex model such as GPT-4. And so what we ended up doing is actually using a cascade of model with a large language model, but a, a simple one of type GPT-2 that we can uh, uh, that we can have, that we can run on our own machines and with all the confidentiality uh, uh, constraints fulfilled. And then if there is some issue or if we have the impression that we cannot find the right word for different reasons and there are techniques to evaluate if this large language model actually provides an answer that can be trusted or not, then we move to a, a slightly more complex one and possibly we actually anonymize the text before sending it to a, to a third party to run uh, the, the large language model. So it's really a cascade of large language models starting from quite simple one but uh, which are lightweight, easy to run, and uh, that help us uh, fulfilling confidentiality constraints up to the most complex ones, such as GPT-4, for which uh, you have to be much more careful about costs and confidentiality issues. I'm trying to keep fit so we keep on changing. Um... So conclusions, uh, we've give you a lot of information. When I started at B12 about now four years ago, I remember we had kind of a magic formula for uh, a, a, the success of an adoption of an AI solution um, in businesses. And it used to, I see there's a spelling mistake. It used to rely on three pillars uh, to have a real business challenge or to tackle, uh, to have enough data in your company to tackle this problem and to have um, the to have the technology necessary to solve this problem. Nowadays, we've seen with transfer learning, well, if we think about those three pillars, having a business challenge in, this comp in, in a company, I think everybody has some challenge to solve. Uh, to have enough data, well, we, we just show you that the, the need for data has tremendously, tremendously reduced uh, thanks to transfer learning and, and the new technology. And the technology is nowadays evolving so fast that is probably a, a very good chance that um, the technological hurdle are, are non-existent nowadays. So, what you sh what should you what should you do uh, when we finish? But come and talk to us because we can we can really help you realize your business solution to innovation and solve your most complex problems with AI nowadays. I think this this few reasons why we couldn't do that. Um, and so to convince you a few words about B12 Consulting. Uh, B12 Consulting has been founded about 11 years ago by uh, three physics PhDs. Um, we have no, I think we, we know more 40 experienced uh, consultants, um, about half of which have a PhD. So we have a strong scientific background. We serve more than 100 clients worldwide, from startup to multinational. Uh, in very many different domains and sectors. 
Uh, we have yearly more than 30 project, successful projects uh, in different business and industry. And we do two, two things mainly about 50-50. We do advanced software development activities and what we talk about, you, uh, about today, data science, machine learning, and AI activities. Uh, we're very proud to have 30% of women working at B12. Uh, and we have been uh, having a, a, an annual revenue growth of 15% every year since the start. Um, we're very, very proud to have 100% of client retention, meaning that the client always came back to us. Uh, and very important, we are purely service company, so we have no IP. We uh, not, have no products to sell you. We just have services and, and, to, and advice and, and development we can do for you. And then the last, uh, a last slide on on are, are we going to be swallowed by the a wave of artificial intelligence in the coming years? I think that depends only on us. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for your attention. And hopefully you have some questions to ask us. Can I go to the chat? Um, any questions in the room? So, I have one about the documents. <laughs> um, so my question is how how many documents you needed to yeah. to train, and what was the, the 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 performance of the algorithm down the cascade? Was it like you know eighty percent okay, and then you have to trickle down or? Yeah. So it's a very good question. Uh, essentially, what we ended up observing is that for that particular use case, and for those specific type of parameters we are trying to extract, the performance of very advanced models such as GPT-4 was essentially 100% out of the box without any kind of additional uh, training or uh, of even future learning. Um, but as I've said, for different reasons, we didn't want to use especially those models. So we actually moved back to models such as BERT, for example. And for BERT, we needed to uh, to label uh, approximately a little bit less than uh, 100 documents uh, of different types. So actually of almost 10 different categories, so 10 documents per category, and just labeling them, indicating that it is where is the parameter I'm looking for and so on. So it's it's very, very few. I mean, if you compare to what uh, we should have done you know, five years ago to achieve exactly the same kind of results, we would have probably ended up relying on external uh, labeling services, labeling thousands of documents, most likely. So even with model of, you know, which are relatively uh, uh, small, such as uh, BERT or a GPT-2 kind of models, those type of dim dimensions, you can imagine to reduce by a factor 10 or even factor 100 the amount of data you need to achieve the same kind of results and the same kind of performance. Thanks. Welcome. The question in the. If we try and travel to 2035, what are you most excited to see in this very fast changing world? Whoa. Whoa, 2035. This, I'm not sure I can <laughs> imagine anything. Um, what are we most excited about? What we are, what I'm most excited about. I, I think really this, this transfer learning things, which is not something people really talk about. I mean, they, they are, they are fascinated by the power of, you know, things like chat GPT and so on, but. I think that this transfer learning thing is re-democratizing really access to AI. I mean, something I really find excited on my side is that thanks to those technologies, AI is accessible to essentially anybody. I mean, individual, small companies, uh, public uh, institutions, which don't necessarily have a lot of data. Uh, the fact that we can recycle those models uh, really means that you can leverage the power of AI for many different type of cases. And also, I think it's 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 good news that we can be a little bit more moderate in our uh, energy and resource consumption, because training those models is extremely expensive. But good news is that you don't need to do it very often. I mean, one entity, either a large company or a community of uh, of uh, developers. I mean, this blue model we were mentioning, for example, is an open source effort uh, to achieve the same kind of result as uh, the GPT uh, class models. Well. 
you just need to invest once in training those models. Then, of course, you still need to invest a little bit to run them, and it's not completely trivial so far. But what, what I'm excited about is to see actually the performance of the, those models to keep growing and the actual complexity of those models hopefully could decrease. I mean, we have this, we have been seeing this, for example, with the Rama models, for which the number of parameters is reduced significantly to achieve the same performance uh, as GPT class models. So what I'm most excited to see in this very changing world is actually an opportunity for everybody to use AI to, you know, to answer business challenges, but also to answer more, uh, I would say, more uh, important societal challenges, such as, you know, healthcare for everybody, uh, or um, you know, access to education for everybody and those kind of things. So that's probably what I'm most excited. If I stick to the AI world, of course, there are plenty of other things I'm excited about, but that's a different story. Uh, I have a question uh, about active learning. Uh, in some use case, did you use like model uncertainty or some like metrics uh, to to know which, for example, document or image to label? Yes, yes, yes we did. Yeah, okay. indeed. in the indeed. document case, for example. Yeah, in the document case, indeed, okay. indeed. 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 And that also helps. That also helps. To be fair, that also helps. I mean, the fact that you actually can select which one is the most important to label also help to decrease by a significant factor the amount of documents you need. That that's correct. And do uh, do you use this technique often uh, for project, or is it just in this case you use it? No, we use them almost always. Okay. I would say, and and I think that moving forward, it will become an exception for a company of our size to start training model from scratch for any kind of specific application. I think 99% of the cases, we will actually end up starting from some you know, standard model architecture and pre-trained model, and then just either modify slightly the models like uh, Mihail explained for the steep cases, uh, or uh, on the other hand, maybe just uh, just using future learning and, and prompt engineering uh, to use large language model to do it for us. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>